Just going to step away from that story to bring you more on this developing story about Dominic Raab. There has been uh, uh, complaints made about him. There has been research done into that, a report into that. We now hear that the Prime Minister has that report uh, and is now deciding what to do with it. We're hearing lines coming out of uh, lobby briefing between journalists and the Prime Minister's spokesman. They say that the Prime Minister has received the report from Adam Tolley this morning. He's considering those findings. I'm not going to be commenting further. Is Dominic Raab still Deputy Prime Minister? Yes, he is, according to uh, the government's spokesperson there. Let's bring in uh, our political correspondent, Amanda Acas, who's sitting next to me. Um, Amanda, just remind us a little bit about the background to this and how quickly we may get a, a result. Well, we're told by the Prime Minister's spokesperson that uh, Rishi Sunak wants to take the time to go through this uh, carefully, consider it before making his judgment. Obviously, we'll be hoping to see that report ourselves as soon as possible when it is uh, published. We're told he received it this morning. We don't know exactly what time. Um, so this relates to eight complaints of bullying, former complaints uh, that were made about Dominic Raab, six of them relating to his time as Secretary of State for Justice previously under Boris Johnson, one when he was foreign secretary and one uh, when he was at the uh, Brexit department. Um, they've been investigated by a senior employment lawyer called Adam Tolley Casey. He was appointed uh, by Rishi Sunak to look into it to carry out this investigation. Um, after two of those formal complaints were initially made, Mr Raab himself wrote to uh, Rishi Sunak asking for an independent investigation to be carried out. Now that was five months ago. This has been taking a very long time to conclude. There are some reports suggesting as many as 24, even more civil servants are actually involved in some of these complaints. Now, we don't know the details of these allegations, which, of course, Mr Raab himself has always denied. He insists he always behaved professionally at all times. But the former complaints uh, emerged after a lot of media reporting about allegations of bullying, including claims that civil servants were afraid to go into his office, had been left in tears, even suicidal, um, with their dealings with him, that he created a culture of fear with his incredibly exacting standards even the notorious report that once he became so angry in a meeting that he threw a tomato out of a, um, a packed salad um, at someone. Um, so this is going to be a difficult decision for the Prime Minister, depending, of course, what is found in this report. It's ultimately up to him. He's the ar arbiter of ministerial standards and he will decide what to do. But Mr Raab is a close ally. He's Deputy Prime Minister as well as Justice Secretary. He supported him uh, for the leadership. Um, and... It, it, many in the party and indeed in Labour in particular have been calling him to set down while this investigation was carried out. Mr Sunak hasn't done that. Some suggestions that he looked rather weak as a result of that. Of course, he'll say uh, he needs to wait for the results of that investigation to look through it uh, carefully. But he's a Prime Minister who insisted he was going to uh, preside over a government of accountability um, and uh, transparency. Um, so, and professionalism, which all of this is, is, is looking um, certainly rather questionable at the moment, particularly after he's not even the first um, uh, cabinet minister who's had to step down because of bullying allegations, but Gavin Williamson did um, over um, some tweets he sent to a colleague and the fact he said a civil servant should jump out the window and slit their throat. Um, so clearly um, this, this is an exceedingly damaging situation for the Prime Minister. He's been ex attempting a bit of a kind of reset in recent weeks with his work in Northern Ireland, um, uh, attempting to stave off this uh, rebellion over the small boats crisis. Um, but now this, he's been waiting for this to happen. It looks like he's now finally uh, got that report. So uh, we wait and find out how serious it is for Mr Raab um, and indeed whether he himself decides he might have to fall on his sword and step down. He did say if any allegations of bullying were upheld, then he would resign. But it, it, it's unclear how clear-cut that report might actually be and whether it will end up being a bit more of a political calculus from the Prime Minister. Amanda, thanks very much for that for now. Uh, if you're just joining us here on Sky News, it is just coming up to the top of the hour. Uh, it is now almost 12 o'clock. Uh, we are talking about this breaking news this lunchtime. The Prime Minister has received the report into the allegations of bullying about his deputy, Dominic Raab. Rishi Sunak's spokesperson said that the Prime Minister has received the report from Adam Tolley this morning. He is now 
considering those findings. Let's bring in our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, who joins us now. He's just been inside number 10, talking to the Prime Minister's advisers. Uh, Sam, many questions for them, but they have confirmed that they now have the report. And to be clear, this report sets out what, what, the, what Adam Tolley has found, but doesn't give uh, a verdict, as it were, about Dominic Raab. That verdict now is in the hands of the Prime Minister, and we don't know when he is going to deliver that. That's right, Jane. Rishi Sunak is sitting in the building behind me in Downing Street, considering the findings of Adam Tolley after a five-month investigation into the Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab's behaviour and the way that he has dealt particularly predominantly with civil servants who have worked alongside him as he's been Justice Secretary, as he was Foreign Secretary. This means that we could be in the last few hours of Dominic Raab's time in government now, that's not certain. What is going on right now is that Rishi Sunak has to judge whether the findings that he is reading about from uh, Adam Tolley amount to a breach of the ministerial code. And now that's the kind of document that determines how ministers uh, should behave, uh, and if it is breached, then they can be fired by the Prime Minister. And I have to say, Jane, if you look at the ministerial code, uh, it's pretty clear because points 1.1 and 1.2, so the whole ministerial code opens with a direction that ministers are expected to maintain high standards of, of behaviour and to behave in a way that upholds the highest standards of propriety. They should be professional in all of their dealings and treat those who they come into contact with with consideration and respect, working relationships, including with civil servants, ministerial and parliamentary colleagues and parliamentary staff should be proper and appropriate. Harassing, bullying or other inappropriate or discriminating behaviour wherever it takes place uh, is not consistent with the ministerial code uh, and will not be tolerated. That is what the Prime Minister has to judge, whether Dominic Raab has breached as he leafs through the report. Now, we think that the Prime Minister has had the report for, uh, for some hours this morning. He returned, obviously, from Belfast uh, last night. Dominic Raab's diary believed to be cleared. Uh, so we could get some kind of verdict maybe uh, this afternoon, but Downing Street going out of their way not to confirm any kind of timetable. So if you forgive me, Jane, I, I'm going to um, stray into the realm of speculation, but hopefully informed speculation, because we have a point of comparison or two. This is the third time that Rishi Sunak has had to decide whether to dispense with the services of one of his cabinet ministers. Gavin Williamson, you might remember, in November went again over allegations of unbecoming conduct, text messages uh, to the Liz Truss era chief whip, which were deemed unacceptable, and other accounts uh, of his behaviour when he was uh, Defence Secretary and Education Secretary. But the complicated case was the second one that Rishi Sunak had to deal with. That was around Nadim Zahawi, the Conservative Party chair. Now, in the end, at the end of January, uh, Rishi Sunak decided again to dispense with the services of Nadim Zahawi. But on that occasion, he received the report into his behaviour first thing in the morning. It was a Sunday morning. And by a minute to nine, we knew that Nadim Zahawi was out the door and would no longer be party chairman. He, of course, was replaced by Greg Hans, who graced our screens last Sunday. Um, and so in some cases, it seems absolutely possible for Rishi Sunak to make quite a quick decision about the future of his cabinet ministers. But Dominic Raab is an altogether... Uh, more interesting uh, character, more senior character, more problematic character uh, for Rishi Sunak to let go uh, for all sorts of reasons. First of all, he is, of course, title implies Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, he's the second, or perhaps third, if you think the chance is the second most, imp uh, most important uh, Conservative figure, uh, ministerial figure in this government. I and mean, when you consider it, he was First Minister over, uh, under Boris Johnson, and at that point, he had to step in and run the country when Boris Johnson uh, had COVID, when Boris Johnson uh, was over uh, in the hospital uh, uh, receiving help with breathing, couldn't uh, function, uh, and it was Dominic Raab who was overseeing the country's emergency pandemic response. So this is a guy who in all but name has held the highest offices uh, in the land and has played a very significant role. So uh, to dismiss him for a series of bullying claims uh, would in itself be... Uh, extraordinary. He is, of course, uh, another reason why it's a difficult decision uh, for Rishi Sunak 
is that Dominic Raab has been a staunch ally for some time. Uh, although Dominic Raab had leadership ambitions back in 2019, when there was the leadership contest to replace Boris Johnson last summer, uh, Dominic Raab didn't run on that occasion, instead just swung behind Rishi Sunak and played a key role, sort of going out to bat for him uh, at all those debates and being a big figure for Rishi Sunak in the media. It was Dominic Raab that was sent to, uh, to support the Prime Minister when uh, Rishi Sunak came to Sky Towers, to Sky uh, in Austerly, in order to do that head-to-head uh, -head debate with Liz Truss. He's an absolutely pivotal linchpin figure. He's a lot closer to the Prime Minister, I think, than many people recognise. And as such, I think getting rid of a member of your own inner circle is quite difficult. Here's another reason why the Dominic Raab decision is a difficult one, and that is because there will be suggestions, there are suggestions, that Rishi Sunak informally was aware of some kind of problem uh, around the conduct of uh, his, uh, his deputy, uh, Dominic Raab. Uh, there have been newspaper reports over time, often uh, denied, that there may have been uh, problems with the way that Dominic Raab interacted with his staff. Uh, it wasn't until November that uh, the starting gun was fired on this particular investigation. Uh, there were two complaints that Dominic Raab was made aware of in early November. That prompted, I don't really think that he had much choice at this point, but that prompted Dominic Raab to write to the Prime Minister to ask for this investigation uh, to take place. Uh, that is the thing that is now uh, concluding. It is the, the formal nature of those complaints that triggered this investigation that take us uh, to where it feels we're quite likely to be uh, this afternoon. But because there is suggestion, some disputed that there was some awareness of problems around Dominic Raab's uh, behaviour, uh, I think that there will be uh, uh, some fear of some kind of blowback. Rishi Sunak, of course, inheriting uh, the crown from Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, came in to Downing Street and stood on those steps behind me talking uh, about the need to restore integrity, respect and professionalism uh, to the operation in Downing Street. And so he knows that he's going to be judged against that when deciding whether or not uh, to keep him. But there will also be a fear, perhaps not necessarily at the top of Downing Street, but in some other parts of the Conservative Party, that it is um, some will feel that it is quite easy to mount uh, a handful of complaints against a cabinet minister. Uh, uh, and there will be allegations. There are allegations in private. Sometimes some of this stuff uh, is politically motivated. It's very hard without seeing uh, the reports, knowing the allegations, whether there's any, any truth in that at all. However, it is something that's uh, alleged. And there is some uh, parts of the Conservative Party who sense a hostility in parts of Whitehall, maybe fair in some cases, maybe not fair uh, in others. And there'll be a reluctance amongst some Tory MPs, I think, uh, to be seen to give in to uh, pressure from civil servants, some of whom they don't feel are always on the side of the Conservative Party. So all around, it's quite a difficult calculation for the Prime Minister to make. That's why it's likely to be going on quite a lot longer than the consideration around the future of Nadine Zahawi uh, when it came to his tax affairs, uh, around the future of Gavin Williamson, who, whilst a key ally and helped him in the leadership contest, ultimately was in the Cabinet Office and relatively uh, expendable. Here you have a guy who's not only Deputy Prime Minister, who stands in for Rishi Sunak at Prime Minister's questions, but is also Justice Secretary, integral to debates like whether or not to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, and has been, until recently, Foreign Secretary. Uh, and, of course, perhaps it was that record as Foreign Secretary that maybe gives uh, Rishi Sunak just a little bit more leeway. Because if you remember the events of 2021, Jane, it was then that you had that emergency evacuation from Kabul as part of the uh, American withdrawal and the West's withdrawal from Afghanistan. And there are many that saw the events, the scramble to get on the planes, the uh, attempt at an evacuation. Many people left behind and criticised uh, not just the American operation, but also the British operation too. And it did turn out that for parts of that, Rishi, um, Dominic Raab, uh, because it took place in August, was on holiday. Uh, there was an infamous moment on Sky News. Uh, where he denied that he was swimming in the sea. He said uh, on The Breakfast Show uh, that the sea uh, was closed. But ultimately, the mishandling of that is thought to have contributed to the decision of Boris Johnson uh, to strip 
Dominic Raab's role uh, as Foreign Secretary from him and move him to the Justice Department. But that's when he gained the title Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, all of this, I think, uh, shows that he is an important figure, somebody who from the, is from the right of the party, Dominic Raab becoming an MP for Isha in 2010. Um, a sort of backbench campaigner, one of the most successful periods uh, of his time in politics uh, was when he was campaigning again about uh, the potential for the need to leave the European Convention on Human Rights or certainly address how that worked in British law all the way through his time on the backbenches. Uh, he joined government and entered cabinet under, under Theresa May. Now, it was when he, was, uh, when, um, he worked for Theresa May, uh, he wasn't terribly popular with Theresa May. He'd made uh, some comments, uh, I believe, from memory about feminism that she did not like. But nevertheless, when there was a crisis for Theresa May uh, and David Davis resigned as Brexit secretary after the Chequers deal, it was Dominic Raab that stood in and had about five months in the job of breakfast, uh, Brexit secretary before himself resigning. And that shows you the kind of significance that a figure from the right who played an important role in the Vote Leave campaign in 2016 uh, has assumed in latter days of his career. He sort of jumped over uh, the sort of mi middle-ranking ministerial rungs uh, above and ahead many of his colleagues because he's seen as this figure on the right who ultimately in 2019 was going to go for the leadership. But all the way through the years and years that he has been in the front rank uh, of, uh, of British uh, politics, there have been the odd question about his behaviour. There was a newspaper sting. Uh, there were uh, questions about uh, how he ran his private office when uh, there was one individual in that office who uh, spoke extensively uh, about uh, her work with him, uh, the stories of how he uh, had a very regimented regime as a, uh, as a minister every day, sending her out to, uh, uh, to the coffee shop prep to get the same uh, kind of sandwich uh, uh, and uh, same kind of coterie of snacks. Uh, some suggestions that he, he, he liked very, very precise way of running his office. And when I talk to Whitehall officials, when I talk to civil servants about, um, including very senior civil servants, about what it's like to, to work in the orbit of uh, uh, Dominic Raab, uh, some might say they were troubled by some behaviour, but some uh, don't. But there, but there is an element of agreement that he liked doing things in a very particular way, in a perhaps uh, uh, a more precise way, so perhaps uh, at points less forgiving than some ministerial colleagues, wanting briefings in a particular way, documents in a particular way, uh, to be addressed and handled uh, in a particular way, and was communicated his, uh, that he was unhappy fairly, uh, fairly swiftly and fairly clearly when he didn't feel that civil servants and those supporting him uh, were upholding the standards that he believed uh, were necessary. Now, there is a debate. It's a debate that you're seeing in quite a lot of places, frankly, a debate that you're seeing a little bit with the ex-head of the CBI, uh, Tony Danker, though that is a different case in a different context. But there is a debate about what different people think is acceptable conduct in the workplace. And there are differing views. And I think that again, is why this issue could end up being a little bit more complicated than the stuff around Nadim Sahawi and his tax affairs, a little bit more complicated about the published text messages that ultimately uh, led to the defenestration of Gavin Williamson, uh, who was the first cabinet minister under Rishi Sudak uh, to go. Um, I think if there is a grey area around uh, Dominic Raab and his behaviour, that's exactly the kind of thing where Rishi Sunak, with everything that we know about him, has a tendency uh, to want to personally delve de uh, deeper uh, and try and get his own handle on the facts and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. So don't assume that just because uh, the report has landed that a decision is automatic or easy. If there is clear evidence that Dominic Raab bullied, well, in that case, uh, Dominic Raab himself has told Sophie Ridge on her Sunday show that he would resign. So he has been quite uh, upfront that if he is found to have bullied people, then he will uh, voluntarily resign. But it's not clear just how definitive I think the report by Adam Tolley will be. The language in the ministerial code is clear, but there'll be a lot of scope within that report from the way that that uh, eminent QC has drafted the language. You don't know how long it is, by the way, uh, from the way that he's drafted his his findings, for there will be findings rather than specific conclusions, uh, uh, just how easy it will be uh, to come down once on one side or the other uh, of uh, an accusation that Dominic Raab has breached uh, the ministerial code. So I think that might be the reason for the delay. It's more likely than not we get something uh, this afternoon, but number 10 being tight-lipped about whether it will definitely come and certainly saying nothing about when.